Yeah, you speak, you'll pick, you, pick your words up. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's really great to see you all. And I know that you're either in exam period or exam periods coming up. So I'm sure you have very busy schedules. Um, and I appreciate the time. Um, so in this course, uh, intro to blockchain analytics. And um, first, I'll talk about myself, <laughs> a bit about my background. Um, then I'll get into how I got into um, on-chain analytics. Um, and the majority of the course will be, um, or the majority of the session, uh, will be running through Dune queries. Um, and just actually, um, so I can get a sense of uh, your backgrounds, um, can you raise your, and no worries if you have no experience, but uh, can you raise your hand if you've ever written a SQL query? STEM school. <laughs> um, what about a, a Dune query? Amazing. Okay, exciting. Cool. Um, with that, I'll get into it. So, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, hi, my name is Jameson Seidel. Um, I'm an investment partner at Chapter One, um, specifically focused on infrastructure. I am more classically a data scientist, um, which is why I'm interested in on-chain analytics and love this stuff. Um, I was a Twitter, I was a data scientist at Twitter for five years, and there I was part of the platform manipulation team um, focused on bot detection and election interference. Um, I joined Twitter um, right before the 2016 election and then left in 2021 um, and saw the company go through um, just so many changes in terms of um, bot detection and misinformation. So it was a really exciting time to be there. Um, before Twitter, I was a professional sports better. Um, I did high stakes fantasy sports betting on DraftKings and FanDuel. Um, I worked with a team that was run by um, this incredible sports better, Haral Balvulgaris. Um, and then um, I guess to kind of all um, same academic background as well, I went to Boston College. Um, I'm American, but now live in London. Um, and at Boston College, I studied economics and philosophy. Um, cool, just to kind of kind of like set the scene a bit. Um, so this is the price of Ethereum. I'm sure that this graph looks very familiar to everyone. Um, you know, we've seen two bull runs, one in 20, um, one in 2017, the last one picking up in 2020, 2021. Um, and now we've seen a massive pullback. Um, so from the outside perspective, obviously this isn't great, but what we're still seeing internally um, at chapter one and on the private side is that there's still really um, incredible stuff happening internally. Um, I just wanted to throw out these numbers. So year over year, there's been a 40% increase in smart contract development, 178% um, increase in Ethereum library downloads, and 12,000 um, decentralized apps built on Ethereum. So this is these are the numbers that make us really excited about, um, or personally really excited about um, blockchain and crypto. Um, and also to kind of level set what I do at Chapter One um, and define what infrastructure is. So we define as the tools, services, and architectures that allow Web3 applications to be built and utilize that scale. Um, and my the majority of my work and my research um, is focused within these areas. So layer ones, layer two, scaling solutions and bridges, secure identity and storage, data and analytics, governance, known API providers. So that's kind of the, the base layer of infrastructure. And then on top of that, we have access layers and wallets and browsers and then applications. Um, and before we get into doing queries, I just thought it would be useful to kind of talk about my journey into Web3. Um, so I left Twitter pretty much when um, money was falling from the sky with Web3. It's just every, the yields were insane. Uh, everything was, you know, there were 3000% yields, uh, <laughs> everything from, um, you can just, like DeFi was kind of really picking up and it was really exciting. But one thing from um, the, data, the data side is that even though there were a lot of platforms that you were able to kind of, um, you know, move money around, you have this new freedom of finance. Personally, I found that I just couldn't get any information about anything that I was doing. Um, so when I left Twitter, I started to build out wallet trackers um, for myself and then also whale wallets. Um, I got burned in a liquidity pool where um, a whale pulled out 10% of the liquidity pool and then with that collapsed the token. Um, and so after that, that was a big motivator for me to start building out this infrastructure. Um, so, and um, so building out kind of the, all like the data pipelining to track what my wallet was doing um, led me into an NFT analysis. Um, and here are kind of some posts that I've done, but um, all the NFT analysis was a lot, um, you know, I would say like more fun than the, the wallet 
um, tracking. I was focused on kind of if you can understand like top traders like Pranksty. And that's one thing I find really incredible about on-chain data is that, you know, where in typical financial systems, you have these um, the, the fastest and the best players. It's really hard to know exactly what they're doing and what their strategies are unless you're on the inside. With on-chain data and on-chain analytics, you're able to track and extract information value from um, from the biggest winners in the space. Um, so that was Pranksy. Uh, Moonbirds was a crazy launch, so I was interested in that. And then um, when um, quote, when um, uh, uh, you, um, Yuga Labs did their outer side launch, um, oh, other side launch, they didn't um provide any code over like rarity rankings it was just rarity on the lands so i built a ranking score for for codas um so just kind of interesting stuff and things that are really unique um because you can get inside information to all these companies and all these um nft collections through all the on-chain data um so with that we'll get into querying um and dune um so uh for anyone who hasn't used Dune, um, it is so, so crazy powerful. Um, it's an absolutely incredible resource. It's unbelievable that something like it exists. Um, and basically crypto data by and for the community. Um, so they provide on-chain data and more of typical um, SQL database structures and anyone can explore that data and query it. Um, and it's, it's really pivotal to most Web3 uh, projects. I mean, and just in general, I, I was, I'm always mind blowing when I explore Dune and uh, there's, you know, a real uptime, like real time information about all these companies, whether it be OpenSea trading activity or, um, or, you know, the step and launch immediately, there's a dashboard for it that you were able to follow um, during all the liquidations after Luna, there were just, you know, dashboards where you can watch in real time what was happening. Um, so Dune is amazing and we're going to get into it. Um, so the first, oh, um, so I created this, oh, um, so I created, a this run book, um, medium article, uh, that will have all of the, oh, you can't see it. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> How do I? I did tab switch, but didn't quite get there. You used to use the state phones. Amazing technology. Thank so you. I put the medium article on the Discord, so you should find it out. Um, cool. So I created this um, medium post with all the queries that we'll be running through um, in the exercise today, just to make things um, kind of easier, move faster. I've always felt that um, you know getting your hands dirty with data and doing it yourself is the best way to learn. Um, so here are the queries that um, that we'll run through. Um, so we'll get all the transactions from a contract, the mint transactions, count the number of mints, count unique wallet holders, trade transactions, and kind of um, answer questions around trading. And um, I don't know if we'll get through all of this. I also want to leave five to five minutes at the end if anyone has any questions for me. Um, so we'll get into it. Um, so if anyone, everyone can navigate to Dune Analytics and open up a new query, I think. Oh yeah, there we go. It'll look like this. Thank you for. <laughs> um, so the new query uh, button is on the upper right hand side, and oh, you might have to. Sorry, I should have said this while I was talking, giving the intro to allow everyone time to create an account while I was giving the intro. But um, if you don't have an account, I think you have to create one to create a query. But it is free, so um, I'll give everyone maybe a minute to do that. Oh, I guess I'll, I'll talk quickly about chapter one while everyone's creating an account. Um, so just talk quickly about chapter one. Uh, we're a, a venture fund, um, and right now we're focused on Web3 and uh, the principle investing in the principles of Web3, so decentralization, open data, trustlessness, permissionless systems. Um, we're a first check fund, and um, most of the team, oh, I guess all the team is based out of the US except for me. 
Um, and we have an office in LA, but mostly we're distributed. And the fund is run by um, uh, this person named Jeff Morris. Um, he's in, an incredible Twitter follower, so I'll put in a plug. Um, but he's kind of, he's most well known for, um, he was the VP of monetization at Tinder, taking Tinder through the IPO. Um, and he's just incredible product knowledge. So it's, um, I always appreciate his insights because it's, he has kind of a different perspective on, on regular crypto, much more like of a go-to-market strategy. Um, cool. Okay. So let's get into it. Um, so if everyone is in this new query section, we'll first, um, grab, um, first learn how to get all transactions from a contract. Um, so for this one, we'll use, um, we'll use Goblin Town. Um, Goblin Town is, is, it was launched during, I think like right around Luna or after it was, I would say during when it was clear that crypto was going to be in a bear market. Um, and it was kind of like a plug on everything's really ugly right now. Um, but so for to get, um, there's a few ways that you can get contract addresses and I don't know how, how familiar everyone is, uh, but one simple way is if you kind of click on an NFT in OpenSea, um, this um, up here will be the contract address. Um, or you can the kind of the more I'd say pure way would be to click a transaction. Um, you'll it'll pop up EtherScan, um, which is the portal to all Ethereum transactions, and you can click the Goblin Town contract um, and then copy it from here. Um, and this is kind of understanding EtherScan is definitely essential to on-chain analytics. Um, it's again amazing that everything's um, open and you can see it, but there's that's would be the, the few ways to get it. Cool. So um, getting into it, we have uh, just this this query. We'll use the um, ERC seven twenty one table from. Um, oop. Sorry, I'm not used to using non mix. So let's see if this. Where's the copy? Control C. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm so used to Alt with next to Alt. I hope that gets erased from the recording. Um, so here's the um, here's kind of the first basic query, um, and it seems because all of you guys are um, for most of you are familiar with SQL. Uh, this will look very standard. So you have the select statement from which is what table you're querying, and then a where clause that adds the filters. Um, and so in this kind of one note with Dune is that you'll have the contract addresses in OpenSea that will start with OX. Um, and you want to get rid of the O and um, add a slash here. And then um, event time, block event time, this is when the contract launch. There's a few ways to get for contract launch, but I guess one simple way is if you navigate to either scan, if you do this in the future, um, you can kind of go to last or click this last button um, and then get just the last the first transaction and um, it'll show you what date in a human readable form. Um, cool. Um, nice, so we can see that within this table, there's been um, 74,000 uh, transactions that within the Goblin Town contract. And um, just to kind of get a sense of where everyone's at, our uh, show of hands, who did this query and is able to kind of get some results from Dune or is trying to, I suppose, kind of. Okay, who is who is anyone like having trouble getting into Dune? No, kind of, okay. Yeah. Could you explain what ERC-721 is? Oh, yeah. So, so I do have this in the article. Thank you. for. Um, but yeah, so ERC-721 um, is non-fungible um, token contract or non-fungible token standard. Um, and so it's the token standard for e, um, for for NFTs. Um, and note that Dune also has an ERC-20 table. So this is for fungible tokens. You can think of, you know, compound token or um, any of the... Uh, um, kind of non-NFT tokens. Um, and then there's also ERC um, 1155, and that is um, multi-standard tokens. Um, so if any of you followed uh, Paradigm's uh, R Gobbler drop, 
um, that is an ERC 1155 token. Um, and this is kind of, uh, they can transform and have special, do special things, um, so multi-standard. Uh, cool. We'll move on to the next one and then just hope that <laughs> this is interesting. Um, so uh, for for a minting, um, uh, for mint transactions, you're filtering by, the key here is to filter by um, the null address. And so, um, and from, from the documentation, specifically null addresses, is this event emits when NFTs are created, so the from is equal zero or destroyed. Um, and so, in order to get mints, you can um, query by from equals the null address. Um, oh gosh, control. And this is exciting because a lot of the times there'll be really interesting data coming from the mints. Um, you can see that, you know, maybe one wallet um, there's been a lot of, I would say, NFT controversy, controversy, <laughs> controversies from minting. So you have sometimes that, um, you know, it's supposed to be one wallet per mint. Turns out that the contract isn't written correctly, and one wallet is allowed to get several mints. Um, you can also see if any wallets got lucky with if you have rarity and um, query what contracts minted specific tokens um and so i personally love min, love min data because it's um it's it's also uh, as a reflection on token design um and yeah and so from here again select all where statement from um cool and oh i guess as we get into it. I'm also want to um, hopefully. I don't know how what your. Ho hopefully, this is also a lesson in SQL. Um, or if if everyone isn't 100% familiar with SQL at Twitter. Um, so because the data was so massive, um, so much of the job your job as a data scientist was to your querying in BigQuery all day um, and over billions of rows, which is pretty incredible, and um, all with SQL. Sometimes we would joke that we were professional counters um, because that was, you know, just kind of exploring the data was so much of our job. But um, so this is this is where we get into the group by statements and order by. Um, so. Um, and in this query, we'll count the number of mints per wallet. This one isn't as interesting as some of them, but um, it's good to have just this basic query. Um, and so you'll see that this um, that one wallet minted a thousand of these goblins, um, and we can see what wallet. Sometimes I like if you're kind of explore the data more um, qualitatively and head into we'll actually see what the address is. And so for this one, if you copy and paste it, you can see that the king of goblin, king of the goblin, is the one that. Um, that minted a thousand, and it's also the one that they were. This was the account that created the contract, so um, they or they kind of own the own the contract. So they minted themselves a thousand, and everyone else got the rest of the mints. Cool. Um, me, I'll. I'll see. I'll give you guys. I'll give you a minute to. I guess if you have an open, it's not as fun. But um, maybe we could think about how you would um count the unique wallet holders and average NFTs per wallet um in for this contract. Um, I wish this was out without the results, but let's do that. And if anyone raises their hand and uh lets me know once they queried it what the unique wallet holders and average NFTs per wallet is.
Well, this is a bit of a hard one, so I'll just talk through how you think about it. <laughs> um, unless someone else has it and wants to talk through it. Yeah. So <laughs> there is in BigQuery, uh, but I, I actually don't know about Dune. I feel like there is. Yes, there is. There should be. Yeah. There's a few like um, gotchas that are not in. So like an if the if the if function is in BigQuery, but with Dune you have to do case whens, um, which is a bit of a drag uh, and not as clean. So there's kind of like a, a few few differences. But yeah, there should be average. Um, cool. Yeah, actually, this was a pretty hard question. I should have um, <laughs> should have just spoke through it. But um, but for this one, so um, because blockchain data is uh like because of the nature of it, um, and it has a you know the record of every single transaction here. Just how we think about, it, we want to get the um the transaction that was sent from the last person, um, or the 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 we want to get the address of the last person to have um, received the token. Um, and then from there, we can do um, kind of count distinct functions to get the unique wallet holders and then the average NFT per wallet um, by counting total number and dividing it by um, the unique number of addresses. Um, here, I I really, um, I like, here I use a table view. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's essentially running a query, throwing it into um, a with statement, and there you'll have the results to be able to use um, below. Uh, you'll see this done in different ways. A lot of people, some people like to kind of not do the with statement and have the query uh, below and then values above. It's another way to do it. It's just kind of, I would say, a style preference um, and what's easier to, for you to read. Um, so for me, it's easier to read this. Um, I also think in Dune, a lot of the times because um, there's a lot of spaghetti code. Um, so there's a lot of just copied and pasted code or queries that are trying to do like the entire dashboard in one query. Um, so I found that if you're trying to explore the data, a lot of the times it's really, really difficult to exactly understand what is happening within each query. Um, so what I've personally found, especially if it's a long query, if you break up the query and put it into these with statements, it's a lot easier to um, to to kind of digest. And then from there, even if it's a little bit slower, like kind of data views aren't um, so, like they're like they're so they're not as optimal. I would say like they are optimal, but uh, and we would use them. I mean, all the time at, at Twitter, but it wasn't like some people talk about performance, but they're. I think for the most part, most queries, you're not dealing with that much of a difference in performance. Um, and so would definitely recommend um, getting used to data views. And uh, one of my friends just did a SQL class and they didn't even um, introduce data views. So which was very surprising to me because it's how I organize every single one of my every single complicated query. I just think it's really essential um, to, um, yeah, in, in understanding SQL. Um, so yeah, so here we're um, pulling the, we're getting the last uh, wallet. So we're ordering all the transactions by um, partitioning by token ID and ordering by event type um, or event time, and then functions here and just making sure that we um, filter by rank um, as one. So that's like the, because the, we're ordering by descending block time, it'll be the last transaction will be the rank. Um, cool. So um, next we'll we'll explore the trades table a bit. So this one's really interesting. It has a lot of really juicy data um, and it's very useful for a lot of different things. Um, so the NFT trades data and they also have, we don't talk about it in the, uh, we don't go through it in any of the next queries, but it also has um, platforms that it was sold on. So it shows whether it's looks rare or open C or anything like that. So sometimes there's um, interesting insights that you can get through that. Um, but just to begin, we'll uh, query the trades table and um, and then query the trades table and also add these filters. So just to talk through them again, this will look very similar to what we did before, except it has NFT underscore as the value name, uh, block time, number of items. Um, so 
here we'll kind of like caveat that we'll, um, it's a lot easier doing analysis and a lot more straightforward to have the number of items by filter it by one. Most trades are single item trades, so your but it filters out the bulk purchase use case. Um, and uh, and yeah, so it just makes it a little bit more straightforward for this purpose. Um, and then original cur currency, we'll do ETH and um, uh, and wrapped ETH, and then. Uh, we'll query by the ERC standard just to make sure that we don't have any um, wacky results in our data. Um, and mostly we're using NFT trades data here. It's it just, um, it's, it's a little bit, um, you can see that it's it's more readable than um, the other table and kind of has, you has the project name, um, category, type of trade, um, and even has the USD amount, which is really great to have um, if you're doing analysis. And, and the data is a little bit more cleaner than um, the other, or kind of in a more human readable way uh, than the other table. So that's why we're using it and it's useful for trade queries. Um, nice. How many, um, raise your hand if you got a result. Cool. Raise your hand if you're trying to get a result and you can't get results yet. Are you able to, are you on Dune? Yeah. Yeah, personally, um, so I would say that for all of my on-chain research, um, I either use Dune or BigQuery um, and use public data sets just because the data is the cleanest and, um, you know, you're, you, you just like, when I first started doing analysis, I was personally iterating through each block, pulling all the data and uh, putting indexing it into uh, BigQuery. And what I realized after I started using Dune and other resources was how inefficient that was. Um, and there's, you know, these resources are useful for, um, they're created and useful for a reason. So now with all my work, um, yeah, I'll use Dune or BigQuery, and then a lot of times I'll I'll like pull data, um, pull data in, and then maybe do additional computation on, like by myself, um, like outside of Dune and Jupyter notebooks or anything. Um, and I would say there's also all these I I didn't have enough time, but um, happy to kind of talk about it after. There's all these amazing websites and resources that um, provide like developer data and other um, other on-chain data that's really useful just to kind of get a snapshot of um, of crypto. Um, so it's I think it's it's Gox stats. Um, this is great for developer data. Is it? No, this one's not right. Okay, I'll get the I'll get the name afterwards. Um, but there's there's different websites for developer data and stuff that at least because I've transitioned from um, a data science role to um, to investing have enough um, kind of for me to make uh, like research kind of to make progress on the research side. Um, and, um, but that is to say that most people I know that work, um, I guess you'd probably have a great insight into this working at the block of what, what data you use within companies. But I see a lot of projects also using Dune. Um, you know, they'll pay someone to like a Dune wizard to create a dashboard for them that will, um, that helps with insights. Uh, well, the query. Um, so there's like a massive project called Ubuntu Dune and you can just uh, submit JSON file that will decode um, like certain events in a smart contract or even function calls. Um, and so what happens is it factors data in the back end and then incrementally adds data to it as things are being pulled and it adds events that are being emitted. Uh, so that's how the pipe itself. I can talk more about it. Well, 
do you guys have like do you guys run no then when you fetch by the directions directly from do you have a like a call? Um, we don't personally, we don't do um, liquid trading. So um, for my fund, it's, it's, it's just um, equity trading. We're investing in um, pre-seed, seed, and Series A startups. Um, so th there, that being said, there are some um, VCs that run their own nodes and uh, kind of stake or have um, like infrastructure to stake any of tokens that they have. Um, but for us, because we don't do liquid trading, we don't necessarily need that uh, like Dune is enough for what we need to do. Um, you know, we're not like high frequency, um, doing any high frequency frequency chat stuff or any um like yeah, short term trades. By the way, Dune don't run their own node. They use nodes in the service that companies like NGO and our uh, whereas companies like Nadison, they choose to run their own node just because they have more power of it. Yeah, um, that's a great point. A lot of there's um, a bunch of data infrastructure companies that that you can um, that run nodes for you and provide APIs. So when I first when I first was not using Dune or anything, I had Infura, which is one of them, um, had an account and just uh, was kind of subject to their API limits, but would be um, you know iterating through the nodes that way. And it's free; you can create an account. Um, there's a bunch of these different node providers that provide those APIs. Um, and that being said, there's also a lot of amazing companies that are um, trying to solve the problem of how, like, restructuring uh, and indexing blockchain data. So you have companies like Covalent, um, Coherent, uh, Gold Sky, um, all these all these companies that are uh, like creating easy to use APIs so that applications can be built on top of them um, rather than because obviously like Dune is a very specific analytics use case. But um, and if you look at Infura, it's structured that it returns the data in the way that's structured in for like like in, in the blockchain way. So it's like not necessarily optimal to build applications on top of. Um, but there's a lot of companies that are trying to solve um, kind of be those data indexers and provide um, real-time data in, in more easy to use and readable ways. Um, I know we have 10 minutes left. I mean, oh wait, do we have, oh, we have 25 minutes left. Wow. Gosh, I feel like I'm, I should have had something more interactive. I feel like this is a bit stale. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess if we want to um, pause here, I can answer any questions and we can also answer questions at the end to kind of break it up a bit. Yep. Yeah, so specific use cases that relate directly to um, the research I've done or um, like kind of decision making within the fund. Um, so I, I we invested in a cross chain um, liquidity provider called Squid. Um, they have the best branding of all time. If you look at their Twitter, um, it's all kind of like retro and seventies. But um, but besides their amazing branding, branding they're an incredible company, and their liquidity provider built on top of um, Axler. And Axler is a, um, a it's um, Axler is a kind of like is cross chain ecosystem, and so um, they. And and there and then the squid is providing liquidity for it, but Axler is similar to um, or or not sim well. It can it's compare like it's it's you know competitors are Layer Zero, um, Nomad before I guess before the hack, um, but there are a lot of other ones that were um, kind of like comparable. Uh, like cross chain infrastructure bridging, um, so I did pull Dune data to to understand what the transact transaction volume was. Um, for that one, like kind of cross chain is really new. There are a lot of use cases, but I would say the transaction data is lower than expected. Um, but it still was, you know, essential to do in uh, creating the investment memo and um, thinking about what possibly could be the future. And what's interesting is, um, I think more so in, um, like, I, what it, I've only been at a Web3 venture fund, um, but I, it seems like Web3 venture funds are much more likely to be hiring data scientists, data analysts, um, engineers because of the nature, because it's so technical and because 
public on-chain data is so pivotal to kind of investment make it, like decision making and everything like that um whereas kind of in more traditional funds um the the profile of of the the people that work there could be a bit or tend to be a bit different so i think that really speaks to um like how valuable um, of open data is to have people who can manipulate it and kind of understand um yeah und understand where the market's heading because it's all on chain Um, I guess what's your sense? Do you think it'll be useful to run through the rest of the queries or, um, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. I just like, so I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm really not used to public speaking or teaching. Um, so I don't know really, uh, I mean, I think all this stuff's really interesting, but I'm, um, it's hard for me to get a sense of, uh, of what's useful and what's not useful. Um, cool. Okay. So we'll, um, we'll, this next query count the number of sales and get total trading volume. Um, so again, hopefully this is kind of provides also some insight if you're not as familiar with, with SQL um, or kind of don't know any um, or like, I guess, beyond SQL basics, uh, the cross join on Nest is very useful for arrays. Um, so when I, for if you look at NFT trades and you kind of um, start exploring the data, you realize that there is an NFT token IDs array and then there's also an NFT token ID column. So um, this are the both. Diff and and they actually aren't the same data. So it might be the case that uh, NFT token ID has, you know, these token that is 20 characters long and then NFT token IDs array has the actual token IDs that relate to um, the NFT that was that was sold. Um, so for this, realize that the data was inconsistent and also not not it was kind of wacky so so um and nft token ids array was actually was accurate so here we'll un cross join unnest um and then uh define what the the column is um i thought i had more about what the cross join does i think maybe it's down here oh yeah sorry i didn't um should have Put it up, but basically, like, um, so for anyone that's not familiar with cross join unnest, um, the unnest function takes the array and returns the value of the table, um, of the array's element type, and then, um, so that you're like unnesting the array, and then cross join is joining that back to the table, um, so you have kind of this this new table with columns that are um, unnested, um, and then from there we can do. Hey, I'll go back here. Um, um, yeah, and then from there we can just count the number of sales. Um, so we could have count start here, count one, because everything, will, all the transactions will be unique. Um, but or we can just for readability um, add the column name, which is the transaction hash. Um, and then in addition to that, just um, aggregate over the original amount. Yeah. We have one row. We have like one field that's one, two, three, four, five in array. Then on this we'll take that one row, take one, two, five, and then you join it back. So you have, instead of one row, you have five rows. Yeah, exactly. So it's really, the one thing to remember with cross join on Nest is that it will, so if you have like, um, like A, Imperial, um, and then you have the array of one, two, it'll make two two rows that have A, Imperial one, A, Imperial two. And so if you're doing any counts um, or, or, or like summing anything, um, just be really careful that it's uh, you use dis distinct when you need to. So, for example, for this case, if I was counting the number of unique wallets that have transacted, that you have to put account distinct because it's replicating those columns. Um, cool. And then. Um, and then we can, um, so if we want to filter by instead of trades all time, um, do uh, like intervals of past seven days or past 24 hours. Um, here you'll just filter by um, kind of do the, uh, the table view again, um, name the table, whatever you want to, but typically you want to name it something that's a bit robust like trades in this case. Um, and then um, add the where clause where you're saying, hey, 
you're going to take what time it is now minus the block time and make sure that it's less than some interval, in this case, seven days or 24 hours. Um, and this uh, now is really useful as just a standalone function. And um, it's also in BigQuery. Uh, you can also, in BigQuery, you can have current date, which is great. Um, but you'll see this a lot in Dune, in Dune dashboards or kind of if you're querying wherever just to um, get the aggregate metrics for the last seven days. Um, or let's say you're working at a Web2 company and they ask you what the um, the, the MAU is, um, then you're going to be queried by the last 28 days um, for monthly active users. Um, so this is just kind of, yeah, just good to remember these like tricks of the trade. And sometimes like the syntax are a bit different. Um, so hopefully you'll run into one of these and have a resource. <laughs> Um, oh, I forgot to unnest. Oh, I guess it doesn't matter in this one. Um, yeah, perfect. So, um, yeah, so this is the query to get trading volume by month. Um, here, we'll actually do this query. Um, Amazing. Oh, God, Dune is so fast. It's just crazy that we that you're able like that we can query data from May and it just like instantly. It's so so beautiful. Um, and um, cool. So this is um so the kind of tricks here is this um, date trunk. You can um it uh, truncates <laughs> the date or kind of um to whatever whether the block time whether you need it to be the month or by day it allows you to aggregate later on in your group by um and then you're summing by original amount for the trade volume grouping by one ordering by two um just a quick note about sql so um the one two are shorthand for what um like what columns these represent so unlike most programming where first column is zero um here you're the first column is one. Um, so grouping by one, ordering by two is just saying you're grouping by this date, um, like the event month, and then you're um, ordering by the trade volume. Um, and but you could also, you know, um, like you can group by, I guess. You can take this whole. Um, this whole function and and like group by that as well, um, but it's just more optimal and cleaner because. SQL ends up and tends to be really wordy anyway. So it's just um, personally, I just like keeping the numbers because I think it's easy to um, understand. Um, so here's another one of the like another magic thing about Dune. Um, you can just really you can take your query results um, that we query in you know less than 10 seconds, which is crazy, and click new visualization. Um, and then from there, just add a bar chart. And um, there you go. For Goblin Town, this was um, this is the trading volume. Uh, so first month trading volume, um, second month here. Uh, Goblin Goblin Town kind of uh, had a really interesting slow rise. So when the mint came out, no one knew who was behind the project. And so I think it was a free mint or very very low. Um, and so it kind of like there was a lot of Twitter talk about it. There was a spike till for until um, it like and then it went to two ETH kind of hovered around two for a bit and then went bananas in June and was at 90th at one point um, and then had this massive pullback. Um, and I think it sits below each, uh, like the floor price sits below one. So it's it's funny to see, normally you see a lot of trading values, volume at mint, um, but this time the trading volume was a couple of weeks later um, where it really took off. Um, so and that's, for Dune, like you'll see a bunch of, um, you know, bar bar charts are just amazing to get a quick insights. Um, so you'll just see a lot of bar charts that are created with um, a click of a button. Um, yep, yeah, and then here I kind of talk about how to create that. Um, Cool. So um, on the last two, oh, and I see we're down to 15 minutes or 10 minutes, but um, so this kind of will be another, uh, like, I guess, uh, hopefully insight into SQL, a <laughs> lesson to SQL, as well as um, the, uh, like, in, in addition to um, the 
like Dune in general. But um, so for this question, we're looking, we're trying to understand what's the most profitable flip. So um, this trades table, like excluding mints, who, um, what was the, what was the token um, or the NFT that was bought for a specific amount and sold for the most amount? So who was the kind of, yeah, what was the, the most profitable trade? Um, and for this query, we'll start off with our um, the query that we've been working on with the trades table. Um, and then here it gets a little bit, um, I guess we have to think through it a bit more. So you're going to join the table onto itself um, with, with the join. And then, um, so it's on token ID um from table a token ID B, and then you want to you here you want the buyer to be the seller um because that's that's what the the trade is and then you want to query also by the block time of the buy to be less than the block time of the sell so those are kind of um and for the block time of the buy box and the sell this also could be in the where clause um but sometimes it's nice as a reminder to put it in the um to be joined on just so that it um, is kind of, yeah, front and center of, of this is what you're trying to do. Um, and again, order by six, like you could say order by, uh, you can put this in the order by, but it's kind of, it's clean to use the numbers. Um, hopefully everyone was able to run that, uh, the most profitable, uh, NFT for the goblin town, uh, it was 68 ETH got, um, ETH profit, which is very impressive, um, in classic crypto degen essence, it was sold for 6942. <laughs> um, and the token ID is, um, this 8995, so we can kind of explore it see what's going on here by um um so when i'm doing analysis kind of the easiest way i would say to explore data is just to like click around and get used to it um so you can go to the goblin town collection click on one um and then i'll usually just manipulate the url and so um insert the um the nft number um, so yeah, this beautiful NFT, the Goblin King, was the 68 ETH profit, and um, it, and which really aligns with the expectations here because what we see with NFTs is that your um, most traders are either trying to buy the like gold and like the the rarest ones, hoping that they're um, the most profitable later. And you can, in example, with like Yuga Labs or any of the. Um, board apes all the gold apes are really really valuable and so much more valuable than anything in the middle so you kind of tend to either want a floor um nft or you want something that's crazy rare and the rarest so this guy um took a bet that someone would want the um the rarest this goblin king um and was correct for that trade um i didn't look to see what if this person sold it um i guess no Oh, they transfer it to the vault. Um, so, I mean, sometimes the, the, these trades, like, obviously, uh, will, you know, you make a wrong bet and can lose a huge amount of money by thinking that this goblin is going to be worth whatever it is. And turns out it's not worth that much. <laughs> um, but this one he's still holding on to. Um, and I'll stop here. But, yeah, there's one more query if you want to explore it yourself. Um, and this one is just kind of trying to get all um, all trader metrics. And this is, I guess, I'm sorry. I knew that there was an average function, but there is a 100% average function. There's max, min, count, sum. Um, and so these kind of take advantage of those by doing um, two query views where you can do trades and flips. Um, cool. Um, and then I know we have, uh, yeah, like, a bit of time left. Um, I'm happy to kind of take further questions if, yeah. Do you mind if we also st maybe stop recording? Yeah.